Hey man, welcome to Mad Dog's After Show. You're along for the ride with me, the Mad Dog, and Cole, the Desert Trekker, Feral. Evil Knievel didn't need no energy drinks. True. I decided to fly through the air and live in the sunlight and enjoy life as much as I could, and that's just what I'm doing. Speaking of Evil Knievel, how about that great intro and those inspiring words, you know, just flying through the air, living in the sunlight and enjoying life. We all need to take a little more time to just enjoy life and live in the sunlight. Absolutely. And we get to do that because of our first responders and the brave men and women of our armed forces could not do this podcast without them, cannot go any farther without thanking them first and up front yeah absolutely and the families that gave all those of the kia mia we appreciate your sacrifice great respect from all of us over here at mad dogs after show man i'm so excited we have an incredibly talented special guest coming up great guy you will love it you'll hear from him right after i do our partner and sponsor plugs Man, we are so lucky to have such great sponsors, you know, great, great people like Kicker Performance Audio, all your 12 volt needs, marine needs, which I've been working on a little bit of a project lately and truck, car, trailer, sand rail, off-road vehicle, motorcycle, bagger, whatever you need, personal audio, check them out, kicker.com. Or on Instagram at Kicker Audio. And of course, every other Tuesday night, Kicker Unmasked Live, their live TV show on their YouTube channel and Facebook. And find that at Kicker. Of course, Bomber Eyewear, Bomber Floating Eyewear, Bomber Safety Eyewear, Bomber Super Rad Super Cool Eyewear. That's what I'm wearing is a Super Rad Super Cool custom mad dog edition boogie bomb mana series with the black logos and the mirror green lenses that are also a safety lens and polarized i'm loving them you will too hit them up bomber eyewear.com or on instagram at bomber eyewear of course the premix podcast and our man cole sharing his love for all things desert racing through the lens of the camera and also out there announcing events emceeing events if you got an event you need done slide into his dms at the premix podcast on instagram and get him signed up his schedule is tight so if you got something, I suggest you get in there, especially if it's a slot car race, because he really wants to announce one of those. Got to check uh, my reflexes. Right. There you go. Yeah. You can find him on Instagram, the at symbol T-H-E-P-R-E-M-I-X-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Of course, all of our video mayhem, turning it into beautiful artwork. On our YouTube channel, Mad Dog Media, M-A-D-D-O-G Media, is produced proudly by Kelsey Morrell Film. For all your film and still photo needs, from pre-production to post-production, Kelsey has you covered. Find her on Instagram, at Kelsey Morrell Film. Of course, our Instagram uh, videos, you've seen we've had some cool some really cool videos announcing episodes. Those are all compliments of Hey Keeks Marketing. She can cover anything from building a website to a full-blown social media influencer campaign, advertising campaign, 
or whatever you need, just yell, hey, Keeks, or take the easy way. Look her up on the webs, heykeeks.com or on Instagram at heykeeksmarketing. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Ralph Shaheen. Buddy, thank you for being on. Dude, my pleasure. Happy to be here with you guys. Yeah, it's it's uh Cole and I were talking just before you came on. And it's like, you know, we've Cole, of course, he's younger than me, so he's been watching you and listening to you probably his whole life, you know. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> just about, man. Yeah, you do the math. It's pretty close. Pretty close. <laughs> You're aging, Cole. You're aging me. <laughs> um for those of you who don't, who have been under a rock and don't know who Ralph Shaheen is, if you've listened to every, I mean, what, Supercross, NASCAR, every, every uh, discipline of sprint car racing, IMSA, um, man, what else? Superbike, World- NHRA. World Rally. World World Rally. Yeah. Um, What I tell everybody is I've done everything from swamp buggies to Formula One and basically everything in between. That's perfect. That's that's crazy. And of course, I'm I'm blessed to get to see you once in a while and hear you once in a while through live on uh, American Flat Track. Um, Yeah. And now you've started Speed Sport. Well, so what, what happened there is Speed Sports started in 1934. So oh, it's wow. nine years old. And, of course, Chris Economaki ran it for years, and it became like the Bible to American motorsports. It was a traditional full and half black and white newspaper that everybody was used to getting, kind of like Cycle News if you're a motorcycle fan. And then Chris passed away in his 90s, and we've been dear friends for a long time. And his family decided they didn't want to do it anymore. It was a family business. So they wanted to sell the brand off. And a couple of business partners and myself got together and we bought the brand. And we kept it going and turned it into a magazine and website and all the stuff that you start doing now, you know, in the 2000s. And at that point, we were like, well, that's all fine. But that's not really where the world is headed. So we got to get into TV. So we started doing some television shows and live streaming and all that. And about a month ago, we launched Speed Sport 1. That's the numeral one. So Speed Sport 1 is what's called a fast channel. Free ad-supported streaming TV. Keyword there being free. There's no charge, no subscription fee, no pay-per-view. It's 24-7 racing, 365 days out of the year. You can find us on, we just launched on Amazon two weeks ago. We got another big launch coming later this month for Audition Sling on their free stream platform. We're just about everywhere. Go to speedsport1.com and at the top it'll say how to watch. Just click on that and you can find the best, easiest platform for you to watch on whatever connected device you got. Yeah, that's that's super. I was so happy to see the release and congratulations, by the way. I don't have cable where I'm at, so I'm all streaming. And I have been looking for Speed Sport online. And then you told me, hey, we're coming up. It's going to be on Prime. And man, as soon as I saw you announce it on your social media, which is what is your social? I, I follow your instagram at ralph yeah just at ralph shaheen yeah Yeah. as soon as you announced it i went i literally i never turned my tv on during the day i went turned my tv on hunted it down uh amazon prime if you go to search and put in ss1 it will take you right to the speed sport one channel load it and enjoy for sure Absolutely. And again, it's 100% free. Even though it's on Amazon, I know that a lot of people think, well, wait a minute, you got to pay for Amazon. Not this part of Amazon. Where we are on Amazon, it's 100% free. Yeah, and that's rare these days for any kind of entertainment, let alone motorsports. 
Exactly. I think yeah. folks will enjoy it. We got a lot of motorcycle race on there too. Yeah, it's uh I'm excited. I've I've watched uh the other night I watched a little bit and uh I think I think I was watching some modifieds. Yeah, we have a lot of that. We have a lot of grassroots American motorsports. We have super bikes and motocross and uh trying to work with the flat track guys, see if maybe we can't get a little of that on there before all is said and done. Working on getting some speedway racing on there and a lot of different stuff. This past weekend, we had the uh, 24 hours of the Nürburgring. We had all 24 hours live, free. Wow. Wow. Man, what a process that must be. But what? That's, that's you know, that's what us motorsports people need. Like, we need to be able to turn it on anytime we can and get our fix. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude. Well, that's what we were thinking. So we propped it up there. Now I just need everybody to go out and start watching and spread the word. Yeah, absolutely. For <laughs> sure. So the, uh, you see Cole's eyes light up when you said speedway. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there's what? so, so many good <laughs> options on speed sport to begin with. And, and now you're just hitting so close to home. It just keeps yeah. getting better, Ralph. I used to be the Friday night speedway announcer up in Auburn, California. Oh, no way. Okay. Yep. Rounds. Never knew that. That's amazing. Yeah, I knew that you'd done trackside at Sonoma, so I guess I should have figured that you made your way over to Auburn too. Oh yeah. Yeah, and Cole Cole is big on the Orange County Speedway. It's just down the road from him. So Oh yeah, he's... my buddy uh Terry Clinton announces over yep. there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Terry Terry's magical. Yeah. Of course you guys would be buddies. Now now yeah. everything makes sense in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Terry and I just did Long Beach together a couple months back. Oh, how cool. Wow. So, like, you have done all this. You've been the voices of all this. And I, and I think we left out – I think I left out Supercross, too. I did 15 years of Supercross. Yeah. How could no. I leave that out? What's that? How could I leave that out? Yeah, right? That's the one thing I think most people know me for it's it's crazy i mean i've been watching you a long time and listening to you and but where where i mean you've been literally on every major tv channel that has any kind of motorsports in the world really i mean it's, uh, it's yeah i've been on a few of them yeah <laughs> but where where did like where did the motorsports spark hit you like was it well i grew up in sacramento california okay and no I, nobody in my family was a, a racer or a crew member or anything like that but we were just fans of racing so my folks took me to my first race at the old fairgrounds mile in sacramento this is before cal expo this is way back when when J.C. Agajanian was promoting races, and I see Cole's got an Ascot shirt on tonight, <laughs> and uh, it was what was known back then as the big champ cars. So back in the day, this was in the late 60s, 69, I was about five years old, and um, the stars of IndyCar racing would run you know, places like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in Michigan and places like that. And they would race on road courses, all pavement stuff. But then they would also get in these big dirt cars that look kind of like a sprint car without the wing on it and a longer wheelbase. And they would race on the miles, Springfield, DeCoin, Sacramento, you know, all the legendary ones, Indianapolis, the mile there. And those races were all part of the champ car trail to be, IndyCar champion. So this guy right here, hang on a sec. This is a legendary champ car right here. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. That's Mario Andretti's car. From a <laughs> few years later, Mario was driving the bright orange STP number two that day. And man, I, I just remember I became a huge fan of racing and a huge fan of Mario that day. And it was on from there. And after that, <laughs> My family just started going to races all over Northern California. We go to West Capitol Raceway, went to Hangtown, 
dude, I actually went to the original Hangtown in Plymouth, California, way back. Wow. So I saw Evil Knievel make a jump out there. Did uh, We would go to Sacramento Raceway and Placerville and West Capitol and Chico and down to the Winter Nationals at Pomona and Ontario Motor Speedway, Gunasaka, Sonoma, whatever was going on, we just went and checked it all out. And the deeper I got into it, the more and more I got passionate about it. Wow. That's, that's crazy. I mean, so much history and, and like Mario Andretti, um, is if, if you're not a fan of Mario Andretti, I, I, I don't know how you could not be a motorsports fan. Of course, evil can evil. Um, we were, I lived way up North when I was a kid and we're not that far apart in age. And, uh, I remember watching the evil jumps. We used to watch every jump on Y world of sports. Oh yeah. Never missed one. And I think, uh, didn't like, didn't Chris Economaki announce some of those even. Oh, so Chris announced all kinds of races. He would do all the big ones, Indian Daytona, Talladega, whatever was going on. And, um, Chris got involved with a lot of different stuff whatever it was on racing wise, he was a part of it. So how did you get into the announcer side? Like what, so, you know, it got to a point where it was like, obviously everybody dreams of being a racer. And I realized that I wasn't very mechanical <laughs> and it was like, well, if I can't be a racer, cause it's so darn expensive and I can't fix this stuff myself, then I guess what else can I do? And I kind of always had a gift for gab. So I thought, I used to watch all those races and watch guys like Chris and uh, Jim McKay and everybody call the races. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. You know, they get to hang out with the racers and everything. So I decided I'd go that route. And I went to college at Chico state, Northern California and got a broadcasting degree. And then one day I was walking down the dorm floor and a guy had his door open and I saw a bunch of motorcycle road racing posters on the wall. And I stuck my head in. And I said, hey, man, what's up with the motorcycle bus? He goes, I race motorcycles. Why? What do you do? You like that? I said, well, I'm going to be a motorsports announcer someday. I said, that's why I'm here to go to school. He goes, oh, he goes, well, we need an announcer for our series. <laughs> you try out. So he gave me the number of who to call. And I called these folks up. And it was the American Federation of Motorcyclists, AFM, which ran at Sears Point, now Sonoma Raceway. And they invited me down for a tryout, and they had 750 entries. I announced all day long. I was the only announcer covering all 12 turns, so I had to make a lot of it up as they were going around, you know. And <laughs> I got paid absolutely nothing but a box lunch. Wow. Man, I was heaven. I thought, all right, this is it. We're on our way. Wow. That's that's a box lunch for a day yeah. on the mic dude eventually they ended up paying me 25 dollars in a box lunch and that's when i really thought i'd hit the big time <laughs> and so from there what when was that like your time frame that wise? was 1985 okay so, so from there, there it's like I, I also started announcing at Cycleland Speedway just outside of Chico on Friday nights while I was in college there doing Friday night motocross. Got 50 bucks a night for that. And then uh, after college, I moved back to SAC and I was doing Speedway motorcycles. I was telling Cole there in Auburn, California on Friday nights. NASCAR short track racing on Saturday nights in Roseville, California. Sunday would be uh, whatever was going on, whether it was Hangtown or Sonoma, Laguna Seca, whatever the big deal was. And then on Mondays, I announced ladies fashion shows at a restaurant bar in Rancho Cordova, California. So I had four nights every week on the microphone in front of a crowd. I was getting paid. Wow. Wow. That's folks. That's called the hustle. You got, like... I, I literally, this is speaking of the hustle. I would get the Friday sports page out of the Sacramento Bee, the beginning of spring, and they would list in the section where the like baseball standings would be, 
they would always have a list of events going on sports wise in town or in the area that weekend. So I would go in there and all the racetracks throughout Northern California would list who was running what, you know, whether it had hobby stocks or sprint cars, whatever it was, and what day of the weekend they were running. And they'd always have a phone number. I would, I get that paper man and I went through everyone, circled them, called everybody. Hey man, you need an announcer? Well, we're good right now. Call us back in a few weeks. Okay. Call that guy back. And eventually that's how I got, you know, four or five of those going in a row. Wow. That's amazing. Hustle, man. You got to find every way you can. Yeah. What, but what dedication to, to pursuing your passion. Nobody's going to do it for you, man. You got to do it for yourself. Hundred percent. Go after it. It ain't going to happen. That's that's crazy. So how did you go from doing, you know, uh, basically, I'm assuming that was like West Coast tour or Northwest tour, whatever they called it back then, Speedway, all fashion all shows, all yeah. the way up to like, you know, ESPN. And, and yeah, so that got me all the way to, I got out of college in 87, May of 87. October of 88. So I've been out of school for a year, right? Doing all these PA announcing gigs and doing all that. And there was an IMSA sports car race season finale in Del Mar, California, in San Diego, coming up that October in 88. So I hunted the guy's name down that was in charge of the event, called him up randomly out of the blue, said, hey, do you need any help on your PA announcing team? And he goes, well, I got all my PA guys. He said, but our ESPN television crew needs a pit reporter. Have you ever done TV before? And I went, oh, yeah, sure. I've done a ton of TV. I had never <laughs> been on TV a day in my life. <laughs> but I didn't, I was, that door cracked open and I was coming through, you know? Yeah. So I started telling him everything I knew about him so, so that he'd think I knew what I was talking about. And he goes, well, let me get back to you. So he called around. He must have called Laguna and Sonoma to see if I was for real. And they must have said, yeah, give the kid a try, you know. So he calls me back and he says, okay, you're hired. I'm trying to be all cool. I'm like, oh, great. That'd be fun. Looking forward to it. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be on ESPN. I've never been on TV a day in my life. This is going to be the, either the beginning or the absolute end of my career in one weekend. <laughs> And then he calls back the next day and he says, I've hired your colleague on Pitt Road. So great. Who's that? He goes, Chris Economaki. Wow. Yeah. It's like a rookie pitching against Nolan Ryan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> See, I have to kind of laugh, Ralph, because you say that, you know, you got your got your feet wet in about 85 and you got out of college in 87. Well, I was recently watching some Mickey Thompson stuff from 93. And obviously you'd done a ton of reporting on ESPN throughout that whole season. And by 93, you would have thought you'd been on television for 10 years. So I got to give you kudos and the fake it till you make it. But by 93, you already had it in the pocket. Well, thank you, Cole. I mean, that's, that's just a lot of hard work and continuing to strive to find more opportunities. So what happened was I did that event in Del Mar and it went well. I actually passed the audition, you know, as they say. Yeah. And because of that, then they hired me to do a couple other things. And then it starts to snowball, you know, and you get this gig and that gig and another one and another one. Before you know it, you've landed a couple of good opportunities like the Mickey Thompson deal. And uh, that went really well. That was an ESPN series done through Bud Sports. Budweiser actually had a sports television department called Bud Sports. And they would go out and produce a whole bunch of stuff. And so I did all those Mickey Thompson shows. Started on those as a pit reporter, then became the color analyst, and then it ended up becoming the play-by-play -play guy. Wow. That's uh, just crazy. I mean, I remember watching the Mickey Thompson stuff, and it was, you know, always enjoyed it. I actually uh, uh, got to go to a stadium race at one point. Um at the kingdom i did that one did you yeah, I, mean, yeah the, I, 
when I did it, there was some kid named Jimmy Johnson running in an <laughs> ultra fight. <laughs> he turned out pretty good too. Yeah, he uh, he he did all right. I think I can't remember what year I went, but um, I used to work with uh, Progressive Custom Wheels Group, and they sponsored Ivan Stewart. Oh yeah. And so we actually got to spend um, the entire race in Ivan Stewart's pits. He's a great racer, man. He's a bad yeah. man. The thing I remember more than anything was, um, uh, shoot, his name just skipped out of my head. I uh, ran the Nissan uh, Mears. The Mears family. Yeah. Roger. Yeah. Mears. Yeah. So in the first, I think it was the first heat, um, they came off the jump and Mears got into Ivan and turned him over. And he came back to the pits and man, he was hotter than a $2 pistol. Yeah, it was uh, Roger and his two boys. One of which was Casey Mears, who went on to a great career in IndyCar and NASCAR. And back yep. then he was known as CJ. Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah. It was, uh, Mickey that was Thompson crazy. Playing around will be, uh, CJ Mears. <laughs> and of course roger is the brother to rick mears the four-time indy 500 winner yeah yeah it's just there's there's a lot of talent in that family but uh i know ivan wasn't happy with any of them that night um <laughs> i still <laughs> i still have a rear fender off of that toyota somewhere up in the pacific northwest i think at my sister's place hanging in the garage That'd be good to hang on to. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. So man, you, yeah. So how'd you get, when did you start NASCAR? When did you start? I mean, cause you've been. Well, so the cup stuff, I didn't do any cup racing. I did one on the West coast because NASCAR at the time back then they had left Riverside and, and Riverside was pretty much done and gone and the track got bulldozed so it was a long time before nascar ended up coming back really to the west coast they had phoenix phoenix got going and then eventually in 89 they had their first cup race at sonoma raceway and i got hired by mrn radio to work the radio for that event because I knew the track so well, I was one of the turn guys. And I was also doing some PR for the racetrack. So the track, and that's, you know, part of that hustle, man, trying to find any way to make 50 bucks, right? Right. So the track said, hey, we got Rusty Wallace coming in early to uh, do uh, some media tour stuff. Why don't you take the pace car, pick up Rusty at the airport, set up some interviews, and run him around Northern California. It's like, all right. So I did all that. Had a great couple of days running Rusty and his main handler guy all around NorCal. By the time the racing weekend was over, the guy who owned the PR firm that Rusty was signed up with offered me a job to move back to Charlotte, which is where I live now. And I knew I had to get back here for the TV stuff, but I really didn't want to come back and do PR. I wanted to come back and get on TV. So I said to them, I said, you know, I'll do that. If I have opportunities to do radio or TV, I need to be able to do that. And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll make, we'll make space available on your schedule for you to do that. So I moved back here in January of 1990 and it all just kind of started to grow in the NASCAR world from there. Wow. Well, good for sticking, not sticking up for yourself, but knowing where your passion was at and saying, Hey, like, I'd love to come on board, but I still have stuff I need to get done. Yeah, I wasn't ready to give up on it yet. And then that eventually, by getting back here, I got more MRN gigs, uh, got PRN gigs, which is Performance Racing Network, which does all the SMI tracks, the Bruton Smith owned tracks. And then that all led to getting opportunities with TNN, TBS, 
eventually got hired on CBS. And, you know, my NASCAR career was off and running by then doing ton of NASCAR back then. Wow. That's crazy. And it all started from just going to the racetrack as a kid. Yep. Yep. That's, that's, I mean, if that's not inspiring for any kids or anybody who has kids that follows whatever their passion is, man, I don't know what it is. Well, I mean, that's what I tell people all the time. Like, there's no guarantees that you're going to make it. I still might look, my career could blow up tomorrow. And there's probably a lot of people wish it would, but, <laughs> but you know, if you really do have a passion for something and you're willing to put in the effort, that's the biggest thing. Are you really, really, really willing to put in the effort? I mean, I get people that come up to me all the time. They say, you know, how do I get your job? And I go, well, look, there's no set pattern as to how to do this. It's not like being a doctor where you go to school for eight years, pass a big test and open up a practice. You know, it doesn't work that way. I said, but, Here's what I did. I announced all these races, a lot of which I didn't get paid at all. Some I got paid very little. And they're all like, oh, I can't work for free. I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you. That's what I did. I don't know any other pathway to get there. Yeah, and that's that's it. I mean, you got to give, um, you know, to to get to the elite level, you have to give so much. Um, and I mean, you got to start somewhere. Look, it's the same thing for all the racers. I don't care what form of motorsport you're talking about. Everybody. I mean, let's, let's talk about a Jared Meese, for example. There's our nine time AFT champion. He didn't start out riding on a factory Indian. There's no way. He right. started way back on a little bike at a little racetrack in the middle of nowhere you know, just hoping that that thing would start up when he tried to kick it over. Right. <laughs> and that's how it goes. But you yeah. stay, you keep after it, you work hard. And now he's a nine time champion. Yeah. And that's a whole nother. I mean, you've, I can't imagine how many champions through all the race series and multi-time champions that you have worked with. I'm very blessed. I'm incredibly fortunate about my career. And I've, I've actually held a microphone on national TV for 36 years now. Wow. My 36th year on national TV. And when I started, I mean, I didn't think I'd get one year, let alone two. And here it is 36 years later. And I own a television network. I mean, it's crazy, right? <laughs> but you just don't know. And you're very thankful and grateful for everything that's come your way. And uh, sometimes I sit back and I think, you know, wow, I can't believe I've, I've gotten to know this guy or that guy or, you know, Dale Earnhardt Sr. or Bobby Allison and Richard Petty, and, you know, whoever it might be, Wayne Rainey and Kevin Swanson. Not only do you know them, but they're your friends. Jared Meese is your friend. They're in your phone. You know, you got their number. You can call them up anytime, shoot them a text. And, uh, to think that that little kid that was at that dirt track that day at five years old, just blown away to be there now knows all these people and can call them friends. It's um, pretty remarkable. And I'm very thankful. Yeah. That's such an incredible story. And, you know, I was, I was reading through your bio earlier on speed sport. Um, and uh, there were some, moments there uh that that actually gave even me goosebumps you know just reading about things that uh you know things that gave you goosebumps <laughs> uh Earnhardt's win at Daytona yeah I just yeah I, I remember watching that and I was you know I was I would say I was an off the cuff earned her fan um, because I was like, I wasn't a fan of some of the points racing, but I was an incredible fan of the talent and the 
immense cerebral racing that he did to win some of the championships. Yeah, he was uh, he's a really, really unique character. Unbelievable race car driver, just unbelievable. But, you know, the thing was, the intimidation thing was super real. I mean, he tried to intimidate anybody and everybody. And he was always, <laughs> always putting you through tests and you either passed or you failed. And if you failed the test, you were on his bad list. So you knew, man, if he's testing me, I got to, I got to stick it out no matter how painful it might be, you know, <laughs> and I'll give you a great example. I, I always like this story. I moved to Charlotte in January of 1990, working for that PR firm and Earnhardt was one of their clients. And they also had Harry Gant and they said, uh, Hey, go pick up Earnhardt in the suburban and Harry and Harry's PR guy. You guys are going to go to the airport, Mooresville airport, get on Earnhardt's plane, and you're flying to this autograph signing up in Pennsylvania. Yeah. All right. Now, I've only been here for a couple of weeks. You know, I don't really know my way around. And I'm driving this big old Suburban. I had a little sports car. I'm driving this big old Suburban, <laughs> two-lane country road. Earnhardt's sitting right next to me. This is Dale Sr. Harry Gant's right behind him, and his PR guy's right behind me. And Dale had on those gargoyle sunglasses he used to wear. Remember those? Yeah. So I'm I'm wheeling down this two lane road, double yellow line. There's a tractor trailer in front of us, and we're starting to go up a little hill. Well, all of a sudden the engine in that suburban gets real loud. Whoa! You know how they get they get louder before they go faster, right? Right. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? You know, and I look around and I look down, and there's this size 12 cowboy boot stretched across the transmission tunnel. And firmly planted on top of my right foot all the way to the floor. <laughs> and I look at him and he looks at me like, all right, California, what are you going to do? Never says a word, just gives me the look, you know? <laughs> and I'm thinking, all right, here comes my first test. What am I, what am I going to do now? I'm, now, I'm, now I'm closing in on this tractor trailer. And I got to be all lying in a hill here. And I'm thinking, well, I can't chicken out. I got to go for it or I'll, he'll never let me live it down. Right. <laughs> so I swing left, go around the tractor trailer. Just as we crest the hill, another car coming the other way. I whip it back into the right lane, and I look back over at him, and he just takes his foot off the gas, turns around, and never said a word to me about it till the day he died. Never spoke to me once about it. <laughs> wow, that's that's uh, indoctrination by fire right there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So. <laughs> do stuff like that to people wow I but if you pass, if you pass then you're in you know and he would you know he always gave me interviews whenever i asked and you know i treated him right he treated me right it was very give and take yeah i uh it was it's funny you talk about the intimidation thing because you know uh robbie reeves from aft was uh stand in he had to stand in on a tv commercial for bill elliott at one okay. point and i think it was at daytona uh right after bill broke his leg and it was a commercial he did with dale senior and so they said robbie you gotta drive bill's car he's got a broken leg but you just go out there and dale's gonna come up behind you and go past you yeah <laughs> And Robbie's like, oh, okay, that's cool. So he's out there and hustling the car. And he said, he came up behind him. He said, boom, shook me in the seat. He goes, he didn't, he didn't pass me for half a lap. He goes, he, he wore that back bumper out and then went around me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's a stand in and he's getting hammered. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, no, everybody was in the barrel. <laughs> wow. What history, you know, and, and, uh, I mean, just, just, yeah, I, I was, uh, I was a big fan of the attitude. I, I always thought that's how stock car racing should be. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was a very sad day when we lost it.
Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I was watching that too. And that was, I've, I personally, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people know me. Um, and I really honestly did cry that day. I was just shook. Like, oh, yeah, at all of this. It was the point with the goosebumps. I was on the CBS TV crew working pit lane the year he finally won the 500, too, which was really a, a magical moment to be a part of that broadcast. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine what, what the, the holy smokes, the, whole feel of the area just it must have been just explosive yeah i remember him coming down pit road you know you see the video of everybody all the crew members going out over the wall and the officials everybody shaking his hand and all that and, and i was right there in his pit box and i was thinking man i really want to go over there and give him a high five like everybody else and be a part of that and i thought no nah, that's not professional as a journalist to do that so i didn't do it and i'm glad i didn't do it but i wish i had you know what i mean yeah i guess there's a double-edged sword in that side of it isn't there as far as the journalist goes yeah well because look i mean you started out as a fan so the fandom doesn't go away you know you're still a fan of the sport um and you have your your heroes and uh, your villains and all that, that you, I don't, today's world, I don't cheer necessarily for any one racer. All my heroes are older and retired. You know, Mario, AJ, Tom Perdome, Richard Petty, Earnhardt, guys like that, they're all retired. So they were my heroes in the sport as from when I was a kid. Today's racers whether it's a Jared Mees or a Dallas Daniels or a Cody Cobb, I just want to see a great race, a safe race, and everybody walks away healthy. But I want yeah. to see bar to bar, right to the line, or a great pass coming out of four, whatever it might be, or you know, a tremendous battle in a Supercross race. But they're all my friends, and I want everybody to be okay and healthy, and I just want them all to do well and give us a tremendous show. Yeah, and I think that's such a big part of all of motorsports that people miss. And, you know, if somebody focuses on being a fan of one specific person, um, you kind of miss out on the adventure. And, you know, I'm not afraid to admit there's a lot of races I've watched, even some AFT races where I'm watching fifth through tenth. Oh, sure. Because but, that's, yeah. yeah, that's where the action is, you know. And now you get to the miles, it's a little different story, but. Yeah. And I don't like just one form of racing. I really like all of it. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up, Ralph, because I, I have a softball question for you. And then one that's about a, a medium spice. So my softball question, you've seen it all. You've done it all. Is there any one particular fan group that sticks out as humble, good race fans? Because in today's internet world, everybody has an opinion, good, bad, or indifferent. But is there anyone out there that is just a better fan base to, to associate with? It's a great question. That is a good question, Cole. I've never been asked that before, and I'm really trying to think about it. I would say that... Um, race fans in general are pretty hardcore as an overall sports group compared to any of the stick and ball fan bases. I think motorsports fans are a lot more vocal on social media, for example, now um, than any of the stick and ball fans. Stick and ball fans will get vocalness maybe about the way they're team owner is handling things or maybe the way a coach is handling or if their quarterback throws too many interceptions in a day and they lose another game but they rarely get too vocal about television in the stick and ball world they yeah. might a little bit but not too much in racing man you've got to be on your game if you say something about a particular machine 
technically, oh, they're right. There's some guy that has worked on that particular engine for 30 years. And if you don't say it the right way, man, he's all over you. I'll give you a perfect example about the hat. <laughs> we used to do MotoGP on uh, Speed Channel and Fox, and I was a play-by-play guy. And we had Jorge Lorenzo out there. Now, if you watched MotoGP on a regular basis, you saw a lot of the English broadcasters from England doing the world feed commentary. And they would call him Jorge Lorenzo. That's the way it looks if you just look at it in English. Mm -hmm. But the proper Spanish way of saying the Z is like a TH. So it's really Jorge Lorenzo. That's the proper Spanish way to say it. So that's the way we would say his name, Jorge Lorenzo. And everybody in our broadcast crew at the Fox and Speed Channel thing called him Jorge Lorenzo. Man, we got so many emails and wore out about how stupid we were, how little we knew about MotoGP, and <laughs> how can we get Jorge's name wrong, and all that. I mean, just wore us out. It got to the point where Jorge came to the U.S. for one of the three races we had every year back then, and we actually had him record a tease for us where he said, Hi, everybody. I'm Jorge Lorenzo. So, and you're watching MotoGP on speed. There it is. <laughs> the man actually said his own name the proper way. And wouldn't you know, we still got letters saying we were wrong. <laughs> Even though there he was saying it himself the way he wanted his name said, we were wrong. So wow. they can be pretty vocal about it, but you got to develop thick skin and just kind of we finally gave up on it and just went, all right, it's Jorge, it's Jorge Lorenzo. Just went with it. <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah, it makes me think of George Lorenzo, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, shoot, I had to think about how many times you've said Sansarillo or Sansarillo or Chancharillo. And depending yeah. on which Italian neighbor you have, they're going to tell you it's different anyway. So just let yeah. Adam say it. And so basically on something like that, another one was Miguel Duhamel. Uh, and I asked Miguel, I said, how would you like your name said? And he said, make it rhyme. He said, I like to hear it rhyme. So, okay, Miguel, do ML. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's a cool behind the scenes story. <laughs> Whatever. It's his name. He should have it however he wants it, right? Yeah, right. I'd agree. I with agree. That. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Cool. What what was... Was... Oh, go ahead. All right. Bro. My, my medium spice question. So, Speed Sport 1, once again, does everything, covers everything. Kind of a harder question. I wish we had more time tonight, so I appreciate you giving us this time. But what, moving forward, does racing need to do to be so successful? And the reason I ask that is because attention spans are getting shorter and shorter by the minute. Yeah, that's a good good question, too, and a really hard one to answer. Um. We have to take care of the grassroots racetrack and the grassroots racing series because if you lose the grassroots, there's nothing to feed upward, right? And we constantly have to be able to feed upward so that we develop new stars. So whether you're talking about motocross, midget car racing, which feeds into sprint cars, or your local Saturday night NASCAR track, which feeds hopefully into the Cup Series somewhere down the road. We have to get people going out and supporting those local racetracks and local racers and the sponsors that take care of those racers. So if your local Pizza Hut is sponsoring your favorite race car driver at your local racetrack, some Saturday night after the races, go to the Pizza Hut and have one and tell them, thanks for sponsoring your guy. I absolutely love that answer. That for being off the cuff as well, that's incredible. But, but yeah, I mean, I've been watching quite a bit of speed sports stuff, and I mean, I was watching uh, some some NorCal racing from Stockton that I would have never seen unless it was for you guys posting it. So, I think that all feeds back into the supporting the grassroots, and I'm just appreciative of what you guys post. Well, thank you, and I hope you enjoy it. And like I said, tell everybody it's out there and free. Get them watching. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And, Look, you know, sir, not just because it's mine, although it is mine, so I need the help. But <laughs> Speed Sport One is a prime example of that, Cole, because we just launched on Amazon, right? Do you know by launching on Amazon, we now reach 175, get this, million active users. 175 million active users. Wow. Right? So now what does that do for all those grassroots racers like you were watching from Stock to 99 there, Cole? If we can get people to come out and tune in and watch on Speed Sport 1, that local racer can then go back to his sponsor and say, did you know there was 3 million people out of that 175 million actually watch that race? That's great exposure for you, Mr. Sponsor. And you know what? I think instead of giving me 50 bucks, you should give me 500 bucks so I can get another set of tires next week, maybe win. And he might get that 500 bucks. And yeah. what a beautiful answer. I mean, just yeah. a lot of ways of helping your favorite racer that doesn't necessarily even cost you money. You can just enjoy it by tuning in and watching free racing. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I wish when, you know, when we were circle track racing that, that speed sport one was around, we ran all over the Pacific Northwest. And it's funny you talk about the grassroots, um, and the progression from grassroots and, and, you know, some people do it for fun. Some people do it to get, you know, more and more serious and hopefully go pro. Um, at one point, my driver, uh, that I worked with, we raced against Derek Cope. Yeah. And he was from our neighborhood where, where our home track was, you know, and sure. then whatever it was, two or three years later, uh, he won the Daytona 500, you know? So it's like. I was there that day. I was actually standing in Dale Earnhardt's pit and Derek was pitted literally right next door and Earnhardt goes down into turn number three with the lead, looking to get the win and blows the tire and goes to the wall and Derek goes past and wins the race and the pit that I'm standing in is completely devastated and literally two inches away <laughs> is pure joy as these guys have done the impossible and won the 500. Yeah. And you know, from, from ours, I watched that race and, and, uh, you know, it was, it was devastating, but it was amazing. Oh yeah. And there was a lot of people, um, I, I wouldn't say Derek was polarizing, but there was a lot of people that, that in our area that weren't fans for whatever reason. Um, but there was a lot of people that said, oh, you know, Earnhardt should have won that race. You know, he, he got well, given that victory. And my perspective is, you know, he had to be in second place to Derek be able to win it five of that race all day long he was right there in the thick of it all day long and he yep. had every bit of an opportunity to win and, and earn that victory i mean look luck is a big part of racing and dale went without it for 20 some odd years at that yeah. place and finally got it yeah that's crazy that's amazing um do you have one more? We need to wrap up because it's getting late your time. Do you have one more goosebump story you want to share before we wrap? Yeah, this one's a little different. So my son just graduated from high school. And I think you've met Lucas at the track, the AFT. Yep. And he... Uh, I had always told him, I said, hey, man, I said, one of these years I'm going to take you to the Indy 500, but I want to take you when you're old enough so that I can get you into the, all the right areas and do all the cool stuff. So I thought this year he's turning 18, getting out of high school. It's be a great way to treat him after, you know, working through high school and everything. 
So I called the president of the track up at Indy, who's a good buddy, and I said, hey, this is what I want to do. He said, no problem. I got you covered. All the passes are handled. You're good to go. I said, great. Thank you. So then I told Lucas about it, and he's like, oh, that's amazing. He goes, when is it? And I told him, he goes, oh, man. He goes, that's the day I graduate. And I thought, oh, <laughs> now what am I going to do, right? I'd already burned the, the big card to get all the passes and everything. Right. So my wife asked Lucas, she said, would you rather go to Indy with dad or walk across the stage with your classmates? And he goes, I want to go to Indy. <laughs> and he goes, all right, it'll be a better memory for you. Go ahead and go. So I called I called the president of the track back up, Doug Bowles. And I said, hey, this is what happened. I said, we're still coming. I said, thanks again. We can't wait to get there. He goes, tell you what, he goes, bring the diploma with you. And I said, okay. So we get up there. And I'm thinking Doug's just going to take the diploma and hand it to him and say congratulations on behalf of the Speedway or something like that, right? Instead, Doug walks us out onto the front straightaway on the pit lane where the yard of bricks are. And he said, Lucas, he said, you know, this Speedway, family is a big part of the history of the Speedway. And you and your family, we're so proud to have you part of our, our family here at the Speedway and everything. And he said, I know this place is very special to your dad and all that. He said, you know, these bricks have been here since 1909, and every winner of a race here has crossed this yard of bricks since 1911. He said, it is your final act in high school. I want you to walk across this yard of bricks, and I'm going to hand you your diploma. Wow. Luke went across the yard of bricks and graduated. He was the second kid in the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway to graduate right there at the yard of bricks. Wow. That was the day before this year's 108th winning of the event. Yeah. <laughs> Goosebumps, literally. Yeah. yeah. No I got, I'll tell you what, I was teary eyed when it was going down. I was like, oh my God, I'm so, I was so jealous, the little sucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that is awesome. That, it was uh, a very special moment for us. Unbelievably great. Yeah, holy cow. Oh man, yeah, I'm I'm teary eyed now. That's just I'm that's to be able to do stuff like that, you know, for for your kids and and the history and the history that you've created that remember people, this wasn't like shoveled to them. This was like worked for box lunches. If all that. day <laughs> if that well you know no matter what you're going to do to achieve your dreams you're going to make a lot of sacrifices along the way and i've missed a lot of birthdays i've missed a lot of family functions i've uh, missed a lot of things i would rather go to i tell people all the time the good news is i'm going to races all the time bad news is not necessarily the one i want to go to right you know so you're always you're always giving up to get but we've also been very blessed that look, I've gotten to know some really cool people like yourselves and oh. do a lot of neat things like hang out with Earnhardt and, you know, stuff like that. So there's a balance in there. And if every now and then I get really lucky to do something with my family like that with Lucas makes it all worth it. Wow. That's amazing. That's what a great perspective too. I, I understand it following as many racers as I do for kicker, um, and then with the Red Bull stuff, you know, I understand we, we miss a lot of stuff and, uh, but you know, the other side of it is how blessed are we to be able to see a lot of stuff? Oh yeah. I mean, not just the races, but I mean, look, I've been to parts of this country that I've been very fortunate to see that I never would have seen if it wasn't for being in racing and it sent me there, you know? Yeah. I mean. Mount Rushmore is a perfect example. Something I'd always wanted to see as a kid. For some reason, it just, I was always taken by Mount Rushmore. I was always like, man, I want to go see that. Not the easiest thing to get to to go see, by the way. I mean, it takes some effort to travel up there to get to the Black Hills to go see that. But because we run AFT in Sturgis, I've been fortunate now to get up there and I've seen it. Wow. That was I had a moment like that this year um, at 
Daytona one at the short track, um, just being that close to Daytona international speedway and hearing the motorbikes. I grew up a big fan of road racing. Um, and you know, uh, of course, working with, with the great Rob Muzzy on the off-road stuff from as many years as I did, I heard so many stories and so much history about, you know, Daytona and even I, I was blessed enough to hold the last to first crash muffler from Scott Russell in my hands multiple times. Call that one. No yeah. way. <laughs> did you really? I called a lot of the Chiefs victories at Daytona. I sure did. Wow. <laughs> I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah, right. Um I uh yeah, it's it's just, you know, I look at stuff like that and actually just talking about that just gives me goosebumps, you know. It's like, yeah, I missed some stuff, but boy, how blessed are we? seen a few things too haven't we yeah yes indeed so ralph i thank you i know it's late um especially back your way uh safe travels tomorrow any parting comments any special thanks anything you need to do well just speech for one man i i can't i can't thank the fans enough for supporting us with it and please tune in tell all your friends just go to speech for one the numeral one dot com how to watch at the top of the page and you'll find out everything you need to know about how you can access it free, no subscription fees, no pay-per-view, just tune in and start enjoying some racing. Awesome. We're in. <laughs> yeah, we are definitely in for sure. So Ralph, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate your time. I know we caught you right between travels and, and uh, the, the history that you have, um, and it's great to hear your story. Thank you so much for sharing like five years old to today. I mean, it's, it's inspiring. If you're not inspired by this, you, you are dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks brother. I look forward to seeing you guys at the race this soon. Yeah. I hope we see you soon. Thank awesome. you so much. Thanks for your time, Ralph. Have a great night. See you later. Bye. Bye. Wow. You ever I mean, watch TV? He called it. Yeah. You ever watch motorsports on TV? He called it. Yep. Um, he was there. Just, just wow. You know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm literally, I didn't want to say it, but I'm literally like just goosebumps having him on the show. Oh well, yeah. And think about, uh, think about his one particular like Earnhardt story, and then think how many of these stories have to be out there that need to get documented. I'm glad we got this one. Yeah. We did our part. We got this one, and, and it's going to go out on a server that's going to outlive humanity. So, man, just so cool to have them on. And it's just just like, you know, everyone we have on here, it's, it's so funny to just see them on TV half of your life, and then, oh, here they are on our show. Yeah. And how blessed are we to be able to do this show, you know, and, and just, you know, be able to get those stories that, that might not be out there. I mean, if you Wikipedia, Ralph, um, it doesn't start when he's five. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, unbelievable. We're just so very blessed and, you know, I'm so thankful to have great friends in the industry who will put up with us for 45 minutes or an hour. And, uh, man, can't wait to see him again soon at a racetrack somewhere or on speedsport numeral one.com and click where to watch and watch free motorsports 24 hours a day. Sold. Yeah. It's going to hurt my marriage, but sold. <laughs> hey, maybe she'll find a, maybe she'll find something. She's a huge fan of. Well, luckily or lately, she's shouldn't say luckily lately. She's a fan of Joey Logano. So maybe less racing in my house. <laughs> Just saying. 
Well, she's new. <laughs> She'll learn. <laughs> Man, with that, we need to sign off. I am so grateful for all our loyal listeners. Rob Mack up there in Canada. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I hope you enjoy this one. Go Panthers. Yep. <laughs> Oh, man. Doctor and Crazy Watson, thank you. I appreciate your input uh, recently, and it just warms my heart. Um, just want to thank everybody that's listening. We appreciate it. And, of course, we couldn't do it without our incredible partners and sponsors like Kicker Performance Audio for all your 12-volt personal audio or marine audio, off-road audio, motorcycle audio needs, look them up, kicker.com, on Instagram, at Kicker Audio, on Facebook, Kicker, and every other Tuesday night live at Kicker Unmasked Live on their YouTube channel on Facebook. Of course, Bomber Eyewear, Bomber Floating Eyewear, Bomber Safety Eyewear, Tommy and his gang just want to make the blue jeans and sunglasses, and they are there. Reasonably priced, incredibly durable. You can get them in over 40 frame styles. I don't even know how many lens styles and colors, but they're popping new stuff all the time. Check them out. BomberEyewear.com or on Instagram at BomberEyewear. Of course, where would I be without the driving force behind this podcast, the one that keeps me in line, the one that shares his passion for all things desert racing through the lens of a camera. Not only that, shares his passion for MC and announcer work through the microphone. Cole, thank you. You can find him at the Premix Podcast on Instagram, and you can book him for your event Slide into his DMs on Instagram, the at symbol, T-H-E-P-R-E-M-I-X-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Killed it. Thank you. Of course, all of our video work being done by Kelsey Morrell Film. And you need something done. Look her up on Instagram, at Kelsey Morrell Film. Anything from stills to TV commercials, to rough production, to post-production, video, stills, whatever you need, Kelsey Morrell Film, or all your social media and interweb needs, Hey Keeks Marketing. You need a website built? She's got you. Need a website maintained? She's got you. Need an Instagram account built and maintained? She's got you. Need to go full-blown with an Instagram influencer promotion program. Yell it. Hey Keeks or find her online. HeyKeeks.com or on Instagram at Hey Keeks Marketing. Man, I am so grateful for the relationships that I have made in the motorsports industry and in all industries. I'm just really blessed. Cole, thank you for making this part of my dreams and nightmares come real. <laughs> thank you for getting the guests. Appreciate it greatly. With that, God bless this podcast. God bless America. God bless our troops. Mad Dog out.
Robbie, that's how you end the podcast. 